Chabad, you know, Chabad and the Rebbe, there was no, there was no compromises. It was, it was one, a one-way street. And, and was the Aguda compromise? You know, the, the comp, the, the, the Aguda is from, makes it from, but, but, you know, it, it's like, you, it's similar, I would say, to the question, land for peace. Right? No, you know that of Rabbi Vagya Yosef, Rav Shach, you're talking about, right, the head of the Sephardic, the head of the Litvaks, they conceded somewhat, and the Rebbe didn't concede on the Nayota. So there are differences, you know. So uh, without, without studying this and, and giving you a, a, a real um, uh, learned opinion, um, I believe there was more wiggle room in the Aguda oriented uh, approach uh, than, than the Rebbe and Chabad. Uh, with the Rebbe, there was no, there was no, there was no you know, compromise. I, I'll give you an example. I, I, the, the, the Rabbi took... It's, it's still that old today. We're dealing with that right now. Yeah. We're dealing with it right now. Looking down with Sheba, there's an article where the, where the, the, the chief Sephardi Rabbi, Rabbi Yosef, just said something today about pushing a deal to, to, to give out all these terrorists with blood on their hands so we can get back hostages. It's unbelievable. It's okay, okay. Unbe unbelievable the different opinions in halacha. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, you know, I'll give you an example. I went to the mikveh this morning. She's based Thomas, the rabbi, took me. He's going out of town. We went, right? Mikveh is called a community mikveh. It's on the property of actually a, a, a Litvish shul that's named after Rabbi Eliezer Silver. Okay, I understand it's the largest Orthodox shul in the area. So, so um, I was asking the shliach, um, you know, is it have bar agabe bar, which is the way the Rebbe Rashab wants the mikveh to be built for for women, you know, one under the other, not side by side, bar outside bar. He says, yes. I said, that's interesting. And, and he said to me, hey, the Federation gave a lot of money for this mikvah. Chabad went and said, we're part of the Jewish, of Judaism here. So you can't, the Litvaks couldn't pull a fast one or those that are against Bar Agabit Bar, because in Halacha there's a big controversy about it. They had to do for everybody, including the Chabadniks. So they made Bar Agabit Bar. So I said, that's great. Then he says, but guess what? He says, what's not so great is that they allow non-Orthodox conversions of converts to use the mikvah. Mm -hmm. Now this, I don't know if you know, Moshe, but in Chicago in the 80s was a major, major battle. I know the fellow who led the campaign. I, I, I interviewed him, I spoke to him, and between you and I, uh, some of the literature upon him turned a blind eye to it, and they, you know, they got their psak and and they allowed non halachic conversions to use the mikvah. Well, that's what I'm told about the Cincinnati. It's a federation mikvah; everyone is able to use it. So I'm using as an example of you know the rebel would never stand for it. In other words. Okay, but it's not the Rebbe's mikvah. It's not a Chabad. Chabad didn't pay for the mikvah. But if, if the Rebbe had his brothers, then he wouldn't accept that, right? Others would. Others would because at the end of the day, you know, are you encouraging non halachic converts to use the mikvah? No. They're kind of forcing themselves on you and through the, because of the fact that it belongs to the to the, uh, feder the because the federation paid or gave a lot of money, their hands are tied. But these are small, important differences as it plays out. So that's my answer, Isser, to you regarding you know the Aguda position. But I, I want to you know for the record, you know I, I don't know I don't it, know enough to. It's kind of what? It's kind of extraordinary to hear of the federation of a federation funding a mikvah. I don't know that I've heard of that. You know, and I lived in, in, well, in, a lot of, well, in Baltimore for many years, and, and right. I, I don't remember anything like well, that. Okay, you're right, but listen, Eli, Rabbi Eliezer Silver lived till about 68 or 69, 1968, 69. Uh -huh. He was a powerful man, 
and and probably you know it's still a leftover. I again maybe the mikvah was built at another location. You know I, I don't know, I, I don't know. But a lot has to do Hillel with who is the boss, the you know the politics, the connect. You know you know how it is. So in certain cities, yeah. if it's an orthodox an orthodox rav rabbi a community is is well tied in. You know, uh, our mind was in San Francisco. San Francisco, when I came, there was a rabbi, Rabbi Pinchas Lipner. God bless him. He's already about 87, maybe well. My hat goes off to him. This guy fought the Federation. He chained himself to the doors of the Federation with shackles. And he said, I'm not leaving. He was sent there by Rabbi Schneer Cutler in 1964 to open a Torah Masara Day School. And why did he do that? He says, you are obligated to fund my school, our school, because it's a community school. Yes, it's orthodox, but we are a part of this community. And guess what? He got them to give them big money. He had to fight for it, and boy, did he fight for it. But he was known as the Red Devil. He, they were scared of him because they knew Lipner. He's going to blow, he's going to go to the newspapers. This guy was, you know, he was from Romania, like my father. You know, these guys, people from Romania, they say it the way it is. And he told me once that your Rebbe, and he was a Litvak. He was a, you know, he was not a Chosset, far from it. And he said, your Rebbe is the only person who has the, the guts to stand up to who is Yehudi, me Yehudi. And he, and he was of the same opinion, no concessions, no conceding, not an iota, which is interesting. Like you would think he would follow more the Aguda, but in this issue, he told me he follows the Rebbe. So, and, 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 and Hillel, he got big money out of the Federation. And then Balabatin, who were you know, San Francisco Jews who were very far from anything and all that, they were blown away. And they had to give him money. They... They, I mean, this guy is fighting the establishment. He's worth his money. So, you know, there's always been, you know, so, so I'm just saying, because he was a key player in the city, and they, they were scared of him at the end of the day, because he, you know, he would make a ruckus. He would go to the newspapers. Reporters were there. So all of a sudden, the, the, the proper Jews would be embarrassed because their names and faces would be in the paper. They don't want that. So here's money, you know? So it depends on the makeup of, of the city, the people, the players, and all of that. Anyway, let's talk for a minute about your base Tammuz. A few minutes. Your base Tammuz is um, not only uh, the birthday of the Rebbe Rayat of Yosef Yitzhak, he was born in 1880. But and he passed the 1950s, uh, he was 70 years old. But it's the day, you know, that he was liberated from a death sentence, which was on Gimel Tammuz, 1927. And finally, on Yudbeis, he was told he can go free and not have a, um, from, you know, a long uh, Siberian labor type of Golos, exile and work, and that was you based Thomas 1927. And Chabad Chassidim since then, every year, have celebrated these two days to the point where in Hayyim Yoyim of today, you see that there's no Tachnun today and tomorrow. And to, the reason why tomorrow, <laughs> especially in I Israel. I started from the Yamu today and I stepped off for a Tachnun. Oh, oh. And that's, that's what I want to hear, is it? That's what that's it's good. Anyway. Um, I wanted to know why. That more, okay. No. Anyway, um, the point is, so, so, why, why you gimel? Tomorrow we also don't say tachlun chabad, is because the Rebbe uh, was given the papers and told he can leave, but the, <laughs> I'm sorry, he was told he can leave, but he, when he went to the the office was closed for some reason. I think it was a holiday or something that day. And he didn't. He no, didn't. It's Soviet holiday. Yeah, Soviet holiday. He didn't leave till the thirteenth. So, you know, Chabad makes both days. When they came to uh, Reb Chaim Oizer, the the leader of, of of Vilna, 
the great Rav and Pamba Chochem and uh, communal activists and everything else of Chaim Eiser and complaining, the, some of the Litvishit were complaining, you know, what is this, a, a, a new Yomtev? What's going on here? So he said, by uns vert weniger und by ze vert mehr, something like that. By us, there's, it's diminishing Yiddishkeit in Russia, you know, people have fallen to the wayside. And by them, it's becoming more and st- stronger and stronger. So, Yudbeis Tamuz, Reb Chaim Oizer Grudensky, Reb Chaim Oizer of Vilna. Yeah. So, like, so... Like justifying, justifying the Yom Tov idea. Absolutely. He, he was very happy. He was a Litvak, and he said, Tachnon, he didn't, you know. But he, he knew, the Fidi Kerev and him worked together in many things. And he worked even with the Rebbe Rashab. So, he, and he understood the the hardships that, you know, because he was in Lithuania, you know, in, 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 in the Vilna, uh, which was not as uh, oppressive when it came to these things as Russia, okay? So he knew what the Frida Kareba went through. And here it's important to mention um, that the, the Litvish Rabbon, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, Rabbi Ber Epstein of Slabotka, Finkel, um, yeah, I think he was still around. They knew what the Friedrich Kerebbe did. They, they, you know, and the, they, they really appreciated it. They themselves and their yeshivas did not do that. Um, they felt oppressed and they left. Either they left Herod's Israel or they closed up shop. And the Friedrich Kerebbe, uh, or they went to another city, uh, another country where, like Vilna, where they were able to somehow continue. But uh, the Friedi Kerebbe called for his Hasidim to stay. And the Rebbe with Fabreng, uh, since I'm, you know, a child, I remember every year, the Fabreng in the Beige of Gimel Tamos, and the Rebbe with Fabreng and talk about it, and it was a very uh, celebratory type of fabrengen. I do remember Shlema Karlbach coming to those big fabrengens and buying Sforim. In the back of 770, at the large fabrengens, they kahos, our publishing house, would sell Sforim and books. And I remember Shlema coming and buying. I would see him walking out with these two bags of Sforim. Like, if someone bought a safer too, and Shlema, he bought an entire... He, he, he packed up for the next uh, three months, four months, till he came back to another uh, big Fabrengen, I remember that. And it was very festive, very festive. And the Rebbe's main Nakuda, his main point was what the Frida Rebbe said, and he spoke a lot about it. Not only was I liberated on the Bistamos, but every Jew who's called a Jew just by nickname, just even by nickname. In other words, which is really the, the, the seed of outreach, of Chabad outreach, is, you know, whatever type of level you are at, you're a Yid, you're liberated on your base Tammuz. Now, there's a lot to discuss and how that is, but that was his message. And the Rebbe embellished that and discussed it and elaborated on it. And every year he took another Nakuda, another point. So, Gidbeis Tamuz was a very festive Fabrengen. Yes. Hila. What was the year again that he, that, that he was let out of prison? 1927. 27. 27. And they told him, yes, I think six hours to leave the country. I don't know if I ever told you, but my grandfather, Oliver Shalom, was, was in prison in Moscow. We had, we have a diary that he kept. He was released in 1924. Huh. Um, if you have a, a, some part of it online, or I would love to see parts of it, you know, I, I, would, I would love to read some. Yes, uh, yes, Moshe. How long after when the Rebbe came back from his trip to, um, you know, he went, he went to uh, Eric Stroll, and then I think he went to the United States. That's later. That's later in 1929. Oh, so, so we're talking about his, but then the Rebbe was put in jail. The Friedrich Rebbe was put in jail again. No? No. After he came back? No, no. 
when they released him, he had six hours, I believe. They told him you got to leave the country, and I don't, I'm and I'm not and because they were going to put him back into G the the KGB and the NKVD. The, 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 they were terrors. Rahman Aslan, our own brothers and sisters, and they were looking after to put him back in if he doesn't leave. So he he had to get out. And I don't know if he made the six hour, you know, period, but he went home and from there he left to Riga, Latvia. And he, that, that's where he, he had freedom. So that, that so, and, and that's when he, he left. What? He was let out and he had those six hours. This was in Moscow or this was at the time in, in Petersburg? This was when he was, he, he was in a, he, he had been sent to Kastrama. Kastra, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Kastrama. Um, he came back to his house in, I think, Leningrad, St. Petersburg. And from there he left. There's a famous, uh, the famous uh, train ride on his yeah. way. Hasidim were able to go with him till the border of Latvia, and uh, he gave a letter to Rabbi Gorari, his son-in-law, to give over to, to one of the Hasidim. It was his farewell letter, um, and he wrote there that I'm not leaving you. Oceans connect us; they don't separate us. That was part of that letter. Yes. So, okay. So again, just to go back the timeline, just real briefly, Gimel to the Muslims win. They, they commuted the, the, the death sentence. Correct. And then they, and then, and then they sent him. They sent him to Kostroma. Yes. Kostroma. Yes. And you, you, you face and you give us when is when he got out of Kostroma. Yeah, and, and and right, correct, correct. And but and Moshe Moshe the Rebbe spoke several times that. In a way, Gimel Tamos was is greater than Yud Beis because it was from death to life. Yudbeis is from a terrible place, uh, you know, which who knows if you would survive, but they're not shooting you, they're not killing you. So it was from, from, from hard labor to from one type of life, if you can call that life, to another life. So Gimel Tom was, in fact, one second, Moshe, my, my wife, who, my wife Zayda of Zalman was one of the previous Rebbe's soldiers in the 20s, he was together with Emmanuel Futafas and all the Hasidim. They were the young Bachar, the 20, 25, two, three year old. They were the soldiers. They were the guys like the Bachar today, putting on the film and running around, the, right? So, so he and his friends would celebrate Gimel Tammuz like it's the greatest day for them. It was the greatest Yom Tov. Happens to be that her Zayda, Reb Zalman, passed away on Gimel Tammuz. But, you know, for him, Gimel Tammuz <laughs> was when he, the, he, their Rebbe was saved from death. You know? Go ahead. Oh, um, who wanted to ask something? Someone raised their hand? No? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. So, again, we're speaking right now, 1927. 1927. All in 27. So, the time period that the, that the Rebbe made the trips abroad was, and you said 1929, so when he was sort of like, you know, going between Latvia and then later Poland. Yeah, so, Correct? right, so when, when the Rebbe gets, when the previous Rebbe get, gets to, to Latvia, it wasn't Chabad town. Latvia, Riga is Lithuanians and uh, a certain style term, there are Herets, so you know, yeah, uh, uh, no, lit foxes, whatever, yeah. But no, there was also strong Shamshro Fral Hirsch, turned their Herod's, um, Navardic. Anyway, the bottom line is he didn't have a lot of Hasidim there. And he couldn't go back to Russia because they would lock him up and probably take him away, right? But he had all the Hasidim and the, the underground yeshivas, so he, he made it his business to raise funds for them. That was a very, you know, and that is one of the reasons he came to United Israel and to the United States, was to, uh, you know, uh, do both, encourage people 
in America for sure, for Torah mitzvahs, but it was to raise money too, to send back to his brethren in Russia. So he, go, so he, goes, to, he goes to different communities in, in, in Latvia, and he goes to primarily in 29, he goes to America, and first there to Israel, in the summer, now, like, uh, and then he goes to um, America for almost a year. And that's where he meets Rebel Asia Silver. Now, I believe he knows he knew Silver, I think, from Russia yet. Not sure, because Silver came over very, very early. But yes, and, the, and, then, and, then, and then in 1933, he moves to Poland. And the basic reason is that he wanted a yeshiva near him. Because the Lubavitch Yeshiva is like the mainstay of Chabad. He didn't have that. He couldn't he didn't have it. it just there weren't the students in in Latvia. Okay? So Poland was the Warsaw was the hustling, bustling, you know, metropolitan of Jewish life in Europe at the time, where it was relative it was freedom. So he moves there in 1933 and um a yeshiva opened there from 1921. There was a Lubavitch yeshiva in Warsaw from 1921, and an excellent yeshiva. So by the time he comes, he has a yeshiva there, and subsequent to that, it moved over to, I think, the south called Otvotsk. I was there, I told you, I was at the building in 1935. So once he moves into Poland, he takes a, you know, He's still thinking about his Russian brethren, but unfortunately, you know, m much was closed. You see, the, the, the underground, it existed, it definitely existed in the 30s, but it was harder for various reasons. So he put a, a great focus on um, Polish Jewry at the time. And... Uh, you know, the Holocaust ended that in 1939-40. So that's, that's the trajectory of his life. The Friede Kerebe was the sixth Nossi of Lubavitch, and he had a tremendous Hadras Ponen. You know what Hadras Ponen means? You looked at him and you, you were in awe between his Spodik and his grayish black, uh, white beard and his, his, his demeanor and his presentation. He was very royal. And, uh, one second, Moshe, um, you know, the fact that he was not, not well, in a way, it, it played well for him. I don't like using those words, Hasashon, played well, but it added to the mystique of the man. It, it, it did, it did, especially when he came to America. And he came in 1940, he was from, the, he was from maybe the first, European Rebbe that came over here during the Holocaust. There were a few Rebbes before, you know, the, the Yanner and, and, um, and the Sadiger, and you know, there were a few, but they were before the Holocaust, you know what I'm saying? But he came right in the beginning, in 1940, he was saved miraculously. So Yidin, was that, was that where the Satma Rebbe? The Satma, the Satma Rebbe came in 1947, seven years later. The Rebbe already had seven years on him, and, and in three more years he passed on in 1950. So the Satma Rebbe didn't really begin till the around the you know the few years before to the passing of the Friedrich Rebbe. In fact, he went to see the previous Rebbe in 1949. He had Yechidas with the previous Rebbe. Uh, he was older, the, the Rebbe was older, the Satmar Rebbe, I think, was born in 1887, and the Rebbe Ayats, the Friedrich was born in 1880. And he was, in Brooklyn, he was like the icon of Rebbe's, and I heard from many Satmar Hasidim and many Hungarians that their grandparents, and I even heard from some of them themselves, you know, in Miami, you know, they're still, you know, they're 85 years old and they're coming down to Miami, or they, you know, they told me, oh yeah, ich bin sein der Ayats. I went to see the Ayats for a brucha, for a blessing, and they were, you know, far from Chabad. Yeah, Moshe. Yeah, so listen to what I'm saying. The, the way that the Rebbe and the Rebbe was in Warsaw, but that was in 19, 
2028. November 28th. The Rebbe was in Warsaw. The traveled. He, his wife, uh, and they traveled from Latvia to Warsaw. Why did they make the wedding then in Warsaw? Okay. Because Hasidim were in Warsaw. They weren't in Latvia. Latvia was not Hasidic town. And the Rebbe wanted Hasidic Rebbe's. You know, Rebbe Mayor Shapiro was there. The uh, Chorkov Rebbe was there. He, he wanted a Hasidic atmosphere. He was a, a Hasid, you know. You know, he invited everybody. He invited the Chaim Moiser. He invited it. But, you know, for him, it was very important to be, you know, in that type of environment and in the large Jewish community the, where Warsaw was the large Jewish community. It had Frum, it had Zionists, it had everything, but there was a large segment, so he, he wanted a celebration to be very respectful. So he had to, you know, he picked himself up and he made the celebration there. Also, it could be he had some very strong supporters over there. Um, Russians who lived there, Hasidim Lubavitcher, who moved there before, and um, I think they did very well, and it could be that they funded, I'm sure they funded the wedding. So he had the room to to make what was called at the time a, a lavish, a, a large wedding and, and, and a very, and, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people. It was out of his three daughters that married, the Rebbe's wedding was the, the largest, the nicest, you know, the most respectable one, you know. Uh, uh, you know, for, 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 in 1932, his youngest daughter, Shandel, got married, I think it was 32. The secretary of the Rebbe, Rabbi Chacha Fagan, wrote to Rabbi Jacobson, and our Mashpi and our Shul, Rabbi Oltan, is a grandson, and he told us that there's a letter that he has, he has 10,000 letters and correspondence of a Zayd in his house, in the archives, okay? There's a letter there where he writes to Jacobson in America, he's writing from, from, from Poland, Latvia, whatever, Latvia, we don't have money to make a wedding. That's 1932. That's how poor they were. You know, and please try to put together money. But we don't find that with the, with the Rebbe's wedding in, in Warsaw. The, the Friedrich Rebbe, I'm sure, didn't have the money. But the, the environment and the Hasidim there, they, 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 they put it together very nicely. So that was 19, November of 1928. Anyway, Hevre, uh, we didn't learn any Tanya today. But we made a stick of Fabrengen, and um, it's important. It's important to share these things with your children and grandchildren, okay? And another, one last thing that the Rebbe emphasized every year when we talk about Yudhis Thomas is to share the message, what type of Oyev Yisrael the Friedrich Rebbe was, what type of lover of Yidin he was. Unconditionally, unconditionally, you know, and the, I'll give you a, a story, a short, there was a woman in Canada, Montreal, I forget her name now, she donated the property for the Lubavitch Yeshiva in Montreal. When the rabbi, the rabbi Kramer or the Chabad, the, you know, who was in charge of the Yeshiva, brought her to the to the previous Rebbe, I think she was from the old country, and but she came early in their family, and they made, um, they did very well. She says to the Rebbe, to the Fidik Rebbe, I'm not from, in Yiddish, she spoke Yiddish, in Yiddish came from, like, you're taking money from me? And you know what the Rebbe said? Nor got face where is a frumer. Only God knows who is from. That was Yoini, that was the Friedrich Rebbe. And your relative, your wife's 
relative, Reb Tamchel Mavin, he was first the chassid of the Frida Kerebbe. And he told me, and you probably heard it from him, or heard from your wife, that he sat on the, on the knees of the Frida Kerebbe as a young boy. Uh, did you ever hear that, Yoini, or not? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My wife told father. Yeah. He, 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 he would always repeat that, and he would start crying. Because he remembered the Frida Kerebbe, and in his house, <laughs> most of the artist is here, we spoke about this years ago, he had pictures that you don't want to look at, and then he had a beautiful a picture of the Frida Kerebbe in black. It was, you know, when he passed away. We have it. What? We have it. You have it. We have it. Uh, it's 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 by my, mo my mother-in-law has it. Okay. Well, he showed it to me. <laughs> he showed it to me in Los Angeles. He, he, he drew it. He drew it. Yes. So, you know, the, the Frida Kerebbe was a fatherly, grandfatherly type of a, a Rebbe, you know, and that's why... Reb Shleimer, Reb Zalman, and, and, you know, people came out of the Holocaust, people came out from, they, they had this emotional affinity to him. You know, Zalman told me, Zalman Shechter told me, when I wanted to discuss Taita, I knew the answer is Reb Nachem Mendel. His knowledge of Taita and science and everything. When I wanted to get an emotional issue in my heart to move me, I went to the Frida Kerebbe, you know, and he considered the Frida Kerebbe his Rebbe, as much as he had a relationship with the Rebbe and a very, as, you know, a, a very special relationship, and the Rebbe spent a lot of time with him, and he spent a lot of time with the Rebbe going into the 60s, even the 70s, but nevertheless, it was all more on the, you know, practical ac activism, intellectual, and that type but when it came to, for him, you know, it was that emotional bond. And that's why I'm telling you. And Steinsaltz writes it in his, books, in his book, My Rebbe. He says the same thing. He says about Zalman and, 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 and Shloyme. He says, you know, they didn't really emotionally relate to the Rebbe, you know. Um, intellectually, you know, they, they were floored, you know. <laughs> but emotionally, they identified with the survivor, with the, with the, the elder, and with the Frida Kerebbe style. So the Rebbe says, and this is the end of that story, only God knows who is from, who is orthodox, who is religious, who is observant. And the Rebbe tells it to a woman who says, I'm not this way, why do you want to take my money? It's like, you know, some Rabbanim say, don't take money from someone who makes money on Shabbos, they're not showing the Shabbos, right? And that, the Frida Kerebbe, he, he didn't, and again, I'm not saying that he, he, he was running around asking for money from people who made it on Shabbos, you know. But when the lady comes to him, he, he opens up for us a very important thing. Don't be judgmental. And that, don't be judgmental. Let Hashem be the judge. And if you want to give tzedakah to, 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 to buy a property for, or give, or for yeshiva, do that. Here in Cincinnati, I just was, I saw a building that an old man who was a survivor from, I think, Germany, Mr. Baumel, he donated to the yeshiva. And I asked the shliach, how did that happen? So the Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Aftzen here, took him one day to, when he started his yeshiva, you know, a year or two into that, and he, and he just walked around the base medrash to see these 14-year-olds learning. And he reminded him of Europe, pre-Holocaust. And he gave a big check, and then he donated a property, right? Nebuch, his son, married out. So, you know, what, what I'm saying is, he was orthodox, you know. Was he upset? Sadiq, a rebbe, you know? Probably not. But... The, 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 this idea of, you know, invalidating people, we have to be very careful, very careful. 
you know, it doesn't mean you have to break bread with them and go to lunch with them. And, uh, you know, I mean, that would be nice because the way you bring people together is through talking. And that's something that I am going, I go through, you know, various things that I'm talking about and making clips about. And there's a lot of people that like to be extremists. My way is the only way. Pinchas. You know? And, and especially today, we need to sit down together. We need to give... I just interviewed a professor. I sent it out. You guys must have seen it. I think I did. Alan Nadler. He's, he was at Drew University in New Jersey for many years. Now he's back in Montreal. Alan grew up as a modern Orthodox, he says, you know, Zionist type of home. But he had exposure to not only Chabad, but Bells. In Montreal, there were different Hasidic groups. Then he got involved with the Rosh Hashiva of the Litvisha, Yeshiva Harbatsa Satora. And he, 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 and he's very bright and he studied. He's a Harvard um, graduate. He studied by Isidore Tversky, the Tolna Rebbe, Rabbi Salavechik's son in law, of course, the Harvard uh, Jewish studies professor. And, you know, I'm sure there are people now that want to eat me up. They want to eat me up. How did I give him a platform? Because over the years, he has written uh, what Chabad would consider derogatory things about the Rebbe's positions. So the first thing I asked him was, Alan, do you hate Chabad? <laughs> he says, absolutely not. And he went on to explain himself. Did you, dis did you disagree with the Rebbe on different points? Absolutely. Can you explain some of that? Absolutely. Now, I had called I had called him, truth be said, a Rebbe hater in my first video because of an article that I read, but I read it too quickly. And I acknowledged my mistake and I apologized. And he apologized to me. And now he says when he comes to New York, he wants to break bread, he wants to get together and talk, you know. Listen, you know, and he, he has a cynical style, you know, we all have our style. He's not a Chabadnik, he's not a Chassid, you know. So, so, you know, some, some of the Chabadniks, some of the Lubavitchers, some of the Chevra, you know, are outraged that I give him a platform. I gave him a platform for two reasons. One, to show that we're all Yidin. And number two... Since his publication came out in a Chabad book, and since he was used over the years by Chabad for different things, who is this person? What, what, what does he really feel? You know? I asked him, for example, are you a Litvak? Are you a Masnagit? And he explained why he's not. You know, even though some of the things he's said and he writes seems to have that slant. He says he's not. He, you know, you either believe him, you don't believe him. You hear? But now... We have uh, an hour and a half or so of the man talking about his life with me questioning him and, you know, interviewing him. So for future generations, here it is. At least you have something online that's been recorded. It's for prosperity. And you decide, you know. And, and this would be a, a, you know, I wouldn't say this when I was 20 years old. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a hothead Lubavitcher Bucher. But, you know, your 60s, you've gone through part of life, lots of life, you've seen all kinds of people, and, you know, you don't have to be a zealot. You don't got to be a zealot to appreciate what you have. At the same time, acknowledge, acknowledge. And, you know, yes, if, if there's a wrong done, or you think there is, in other words, I don't, I apologize, but and we both agree to this. I wasn't wrong in my initial calling him a Rebbe hater. At the end, I'm wrong because he's not a Rebbe hater, and I apologize for that. But initially, if you read the letter, that the, the, the article that was included, he calls Shluchem Moonies, you know, that he's telling his father, oh, I met all these Moonies. He goes into the Rebbe at 16 years old. That would be probably in the 1960s, and he says... Big deal, what did he tell me? I should be succeed in life. I'm coming here for inspiration. 
Right? So I felt that was, come on, man. What do you want, what do you, what do you want the rabbit to do with you? Give, you? give you a prize? You know? So he kind, to me, he kind of dismisses the rabbit. You know, he, he's making fun and it's like, you know, at the end he says, so I guess the rebel was right that I will grow, I, I have the power to grow up to be someone important, but not a Chabadnik, as the Rebbe thought, but a Litvak. Uh, you know, more in the Litvak way, because he wrote a book on the Vilna Goin. You know, so well, I put all these comments together, and I walk away saying, hey, Mr. Professor Nadler, hey, you don't like Chabad. I mean, you don't like the Rebbe. You really have some, right? Okay. And then I reread it, and I said, you know, he definitely has a disagreement, but he's not a hater. He's not a hater. He's not a hater. It's fine to, to initially, you know, but then come to your senses. Wake up. Admit you're wrong and go on. And when people see that, they join. They want to get involved. We all make mistakes. Who's perfect? Who's perfect? Anyone says they're perfect, go far, go far away from them. Okay? Anyway, anyone wanted to ask something, or is that it? Hebra, have a great Shabbos. It's the Shabbos also before you, uh, Shabbos of Atamos. We will learn in Mitzvah every day next week, including Shabbos of Atamos. Uh, Tanya, you get us a tshuva. Zion, we're in the middle. I do hope to finish the get us a tshuva by the time we break for our three, three and a half week break, which is um, before Tisha B'Av, which we will celebrate in Yerushalayim, Amen, with the rebuilding of the base of Hikdash. Love you all. Zaydezun, stay in touch. Take it. Great Fabrengen. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye-bye.